Hi, I'm Jim W6LG, your ham radio Elmer here on YouTube. Thanks for joining me in my radio room. In the past, I talked about the Drake L4B and what a bargain I think it is. It's an RF deck that is just built so much stronger than a lot of what is out there today. If you set that down next to an AL82B, for example, the Drake is a very, very heavy duty design. And it can be bought for eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars, depending on depending on its, on its condition, and, and sometimes it's from an estate sale or a club sale, and you can get a real bargain, as opposed to four thousand dollars for a new amplifier. Having said that, though, all those amps, including the ones from Ameritron, have lethal vo voltages inside, and you have to be extraordinarily careful which is to say it's unplugged and then discharged with a screwdriver after it's sat for a while. Don't ever put your hands inside that thing until you have absolutely positive, positively checked everything. Um, so what I want to do is go over the basic schematic for a pair of 3500Zs. The schematic dates back to the 1960s. It was drawn by uh, iMac and Bill or W6SAI. And as I said, I've erased a bunch of parts and I've added some labels. Then at the end of that, I'll show some of the parts that go inside of an amplifier so you have an idea what they look like. Again, it, amplifiers today are becoming incredibly expensive. You may be able to still get a bargain if you shop around, especially for an older amplifier. Fatal flaws in buying an amplifier might be the tubes if um, they can't be gotten, like an 8877 is incredibly expensive. Uh, I failed to mention Henry amplifiers. They're, they're built like battleships. Um, a broken pan switch might be fatal. A um, uh, tube sockets, tubes can be replaced, although expensive. Um, Air variable capacitors can be fixed, but it can be a lot of work. Um, I would tend to shy away from one of those. Uh, pretty much everything else, like the plate choke and other stuff on the inside that might get burned in uh, by mishandling, mistuning, absolutely positively. The major flaw in a guy operating an amplifier is incorrectly tuning it up. You tune for max out period. And you watch the grid current, you don't overdrive it, um, and you do the procedure that I showed in so many videos now. So let's look at the schematic. I'll go over the parts. Um, I've labeled them in red, and then I'll show you some of them with another camera. And um, I, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Okay, so here's where the RF goes in. This would be the coax connector. There would be a relay here connected to the output. So the input could go directly to the antenna and bypass all of this stuff. Also, um, during transmit, that relay would perform the function of connecting this input to the tubes. Now, before we get to the tubes, because the tubes had a, an impedance different than 50 ohms and would vary... Um, there's a tuned circuit, and the tuned circuit, like a little antenna tuner, sits right here. So we have the input, and these. this is a switch, and there are separate coils for each of the bands with a slug, that's what the arrow's about, to adjust the impedance, the impedance matching. That RF goes into the cathode of the tubes, and in this case we've got two tubes, so it's being split between the two tubes. So now we've got the cathode and on these tubes the cathode is heated directly by the filament transformer. So the filament transformer which is drawn down here uh, provides the 5 volts at 30 amps for the two tubes. And because they're connected to the filament the cathode heats up almost immediately. But now we've got our F going on to the filament. So to keep that from happening, uh, from going down into, into the transformer, there's a choke. So there's a filament choke. Uh, it was wound either on some kind of ferrite early on. The cores are a little bit different today. 
Um, any number could be a uh, uh, one that sort of looks like a donut or it could be a rod. So this keeps the RF from going into the filament transformer and towards the power supply. Now to get the tubes going we have to provide some voltage and in this case it could be around 3500 volts. That would come in here and connect to the top of the tubes. And again we want to keep there's RF at the top of the tubes. You want to keep RF from going towards the power supply. So there are chokes placed in that lead also. And they're called, or can be called, a plate choke. There may be more than one, um, and there's also capacitors to ground. Another important part of the circuit is these little gizmos at the top of the tubes. If the tube has a lot of amplification, it wants to uh, oscillate, sometimes do weird things. So uh, to stop that, there are parasitic chokes in the plate lead to the two tubes. They're a bit tricky. Um, it's a resistor and a coil. But once you get that set, uh, and you can tell pretty quickly if, uh, if that's the right value, because the tube, the tube won't oscillate on its own. So you've got the input tune circuit goes into the tubes. This prevents that RF from going towards the filament transformer. The tubes provide amplification because we've got virtually zero volts at the bottom. I say bottom, but they're constructed in a different way. And, but the top of the tube, where that plate cap is, has a lot of voltage on it. So those electrons get going uh, towards that plate. And you've heard of grounded grid. This is the grid of the two tubes and the little symbol for being at ground. The RF flows out of the top of the tubes. It's protected from going into the power supply through a plate choke. The DC voltage, so this is common mode. It's got DC on it and it's got RF on it. To keep the DC from going to the, the tank circuit, there's a capacitor right here called a doorknob capacitor. And I'll show you what one of those looks like. This is, if you will, sort of an antenna tuner. So we've got the tank circuit and um, we've got a variable capacitor called a plate tune capacitor and a load capacitor or load control. Output of the tube then comes out here and again it's the idea of this antenna tuner is to take the high impedance of these tubes and take it down to 50 ohms or something close to that. Um, the metering is done in a really clever way in, in the uh, low voltage leads. So instead of having the, uh, uh, let's say the, the play current meter in this lead, we can put it in this lead, which is just slightly above ground. That means the play current meter is just a few volts above ground, but it's reading the current. There's also the all important grid current meter drawn over here. And basically, um, those are the stripped down parts and pieces of a linear amplifier. The amplifier, and now let's look at some of the parts and pieces that we've talked about. Uh, and I'm going to do that using another camera as best I can. So let's do that now. Okay, so that's a, a typical tuned input. And you can see the... Uh, I don't know if it's going to focus or not, the slugs that you adjust and the switch to pick the correct band. We talked about the um, the tubes and, and uh, this is what a typical tube socket would look like in a uh, like a Drake L4B or an SB220. This is the plate choke that would be standing up in a typical amplifier. Uh, again, the high voltage would be at the bottom where my thumb is, and the top of that would be connected to the tubes. To keep um, separate the uh, top of the plate choke from the tank circuit, there's a plate blocking capacitor like this. So this stops the DC but allows the RF to go through to the uh, tank circuit. The tank circuit can look like a lot of different things. This is uh, 
fairly heavy duty one. It's um, like a ribbon. It's silver plated. Uh, the coil that's separate from the other is the 10 meter coil. It's on standoffs. Could also look like this. This is a roller inductor. Get that into picture. And this is a variable way to get the same thing without having to have a band switch. And the roller is sort of near where my thumb is or finger. So that's the contact for the co to the coil. The capacitors that make up the plate tune uh, can look something like this. Versions of this could be smaller, could be bigger. Uh, this one's designed for fairly high voltage because you can see the separation between the plates. I mentioned the changeover relay. In one amplifier I use this guy which is really ancient but it's a vacuum relay and um, in one position uh, the amplifier was in the circuit and the other position it was out of the circuit. Using a vacuum relay uh, those things literally will uh, will last forever. In order to measure the or yeah, in order to measure the high voltage, uh, there's a series of resistors that uh, drop the um, the voltage down to a number that can be read by a meter without it being dangerous. So each one of these is uh, one meg ohm. They're in that tube to keep it isolated, insulated, I should say. All right, that's the uh, the guts of an amplifier. Was <laughs> some of the guts of an amplifier anyway. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. If you have any questions, post them below. If you have any suggestions, post that below also. Thank for thanks for watching. I'm Jim, W6LG in Rockland, California, 73.